Okay, well, uh, Dr. Ken Campos, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Well, thank you, Jonathan. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, so my name is Dr. Ken, and my doctor part is in uh, medicine, and particularly in the specialty of psychiatry. And I did spend some early years doing a neurochemistry research at NIH, and then 20 years of my life in closed lock hospitals working with severely mentally ill. And I've been a student of Theosophy for quite some time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ken. Uh, Helena Karakazi, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, uh, happy to be here with such great people. And I've been uh, studying the brain uh, and imaging it, uh, the brainwave frequencies, body frequencies, uh, teaching neurofeedback uh, in private practice uh, about 30 years now. Thanks, Elena. And Dr. Jennings, would you kindly uh, say hi and let us know <laughs> what your background is? Really short and sweet. Hi, background in uh, psychiatry and neurology and um, everything in between. <laughs> and general, general and child psychiatry. Right. Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean that that that's the 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 bulk of the patient load, but um, clearly, you know, the neurological and the medical pieces come in there, and we end up doing a lot of work with kids, especially as it relates to the schools, the dynamics, the risk of school shootings, and whether kids are at risk for that, especially in today's climate. So it's it's pretty busy in in the, in that respect. Yeah, I can imagine. All right, well, uh, thanks to the three of you for being here. I am going to share my screen. Oh, by the way, I'm just going to mention that um, next week uh, there will be a presentation on Aquarian therapy. And after that, um, it'll we'll do something in honor of ULT Day. In this case, we're calling it the United Lodge of Theosophists, a quintessential ideal. And then after that, we will hear a presentation on Songkhapa, very key figure in the um, occult aspect of the theosophical movement. And uh, after that, the religion of solidarity. So those are the events that are coming up. Let me share my, um, get, change this, and it might take me a minute to pull up the PowerPoint here. Here we go. And this is a keynote presentation. We have all of 11 slides here today. And let me do play so it'll this. Okay, uh, Truth, are you still here? Could you explain the slide that you created here, this flyer? If not, I can do it. Do something here. Uh, yes, um, this was one uh, image from a document that was used, um, I, I think, politically in a way to um, sway the Visigoths into converting to Christianity. But so I have some reservations about using it, but um, as Jonathan and I spoke, um, we, you know, there's embedded knowledge and information preserved in some propaganda and um, imagery. So I, I thought it was um, worth including the four um, women there are representing the four elements, uh, earth, air, fire, and water. And, um, I can't lean the, read the Latin and I didn't have time to do more research on it, but um, I can send a link later with which, which well, our present, is information. Our presentations on thought, will, feeling, and health. And how does that work to, with the elements? Oh, yes. Yeah. So um, in terms of uh, drawing a correspondence, um, thought um, would be um, the element of air as um, described by Alvin Boyd Kuhn. Um, earth would be um, uh, healing because that's you know what tangible our bodies are you know healing uh, feeling um, would be water and uh, will would be fire I, I'm sorry I'm at work oh yeah no problem yeah I didn't really uh, take that into account did I well thank you very much for that and um, we have this uh, pretty 
an incredible quote from Apollonius of Tyana, and it says that no creature can be sound so long as the higher part in it is sickly. Um, hopefully we will be addressing uh, this whole orientation and especially in relation to how um, the mind um, affects health. All right. All right. Um, I wanted to just start off by um, reading out aloud a, a quotation from Isis and Veils on page 88, first volume from HPB. Um, and she kind of has a pretty harsh um, approach to the way that she's going to talk about the, the field of medicine. And um, I was going to call on uh, Dr. Ken to comment on this and see if he thinks that this is still true. And I'm going to be call, calling at first, at least, on um, specific um, panelists by name just to create some kind of um, flow. But even though I call on one person by name, please, other panelists, feel free to jump in. Um, so I got to do something here. I'm so sorry. I just moved out here. There we go. Now I'm going to go here. The, uh, the view was covering up my vision of the screen here. Okay, so this is what HPB says. She kind of comes out swinging here. Um, it is in vain to remind them that of the so-called exact sciences, medicine confessedly least deserves the name of exact sciences. sciences. The least descent from their promulgated doctrines is resented as a heresy. And though an unpopular and unrecognized curative method should be shown to save thousands, they seem as a body disposed to cling to accepted hypotheses and prescriptions and decry both innovator and innovation until they get the mint stamp of regularity. Theoretically, the most benignant, at the same time, no other school of science exhibits so many instances of petty prejudice, materialism, atheism, and malicious stubbornness as, as medicine. I was going to ask, call on Dr. Ken. What do you think about that? Do you think that's still true? Do you think it was true then? Has it changed? You know, I think uh, there is progress. I'm very optimistic. However, I would say that there's still a lot of truisms in this statement from over a hundred years ago. Uh, you know, being theoretically the most benignant, you know, medicine does try to do good things. First, do no harm from Hippocrates, but there is still a lot of. Uh, petty prejudice, the materialism is rampant this century, and um, the atheism is kind of fascinating. Here in psychiatry, I know in my residency in the 80s, we were still kind of fighting against the um, idea that psychiatry, that psychiatrists were godless, <laughs> that we had totally rejected any spiritual or, or godlike concepts at all. So we had a lot of bad things to deal with. And as far as, science, as medicine being an exact science, I would say it really isn't. It's more of an art mixing, uh, you know, clinical science, you know, molecular biology, you know, chemistry, that sort of thing with human physiology and then the art of the individual, individual person. And then in terms of prejudices within the population, you know, in my limited experience working, say, in, in uh, research at NIH or in a state hospital with the staff of 30 other psychiatrists, and then of course in residency training with other kinds of doctors, there really is a lot of, uh, I would say maybe narcissism, <laughs> kind of a father knows best idea that has been very, very strong in the 1900s. This century, I think it is definitely softening up, but even ideas such as working with nurse practitioners in psychiatry is still gaining ground in that field of medicine, uh, using physician extenders has been gaining ground as well, but working with other hypotheses is difficult. Here in California, and I'm sure in parts of New York, the idea of using alternative and integrative medicine is very big, and that started at NIH, and there's been a 30-year, a 30-year-long uh, track record, actually, yeah, about 30 years, 
of NIH looking at traditional Chinese medicine and Hindu Indian Ayurvedic medicine and beginning to uh, realize there is some value there in bringing that to the attention of regular uh, mainstream medicine. So the, I'm, I'm optimistic. <laughs> wow, wow. Uh, thank you very much. That's very helpful. Um, so would any of our other panelists uh, care to quickly weigh in on that? Okay, in that case, oh yeah, go ahead. I don't want to rush too much here. Okay, I'm going to go to the next. Uh, um, oh, by the way, let me go back to the last slide here. There is um, a interesting comment from HPB also, and this one is actually from uh, The Secret Doctrine, first volume, page 261. HPB, and this question will be for Helena Karakazi, she makes a mysterious comment, kind of a, like a prophecy, you could say. Um, chemistry and physiology are the two great magicians of the future. Helena, do you have any comment on that? Or what do you think of that one? Well, I think uh, this was a, a fabulous uh, prediction on her part. Uh, certainly, she saw that uh, science in her day was becoming uh, very material, had be become very materialistic. And she was concerned uh, that uh, the concept of what you might say, higher occult neurology <laughs> would be left out of, of the equation. And uh, right, rightfully uh, so. Uh, between that and uh, dogmatic religious thinking, uh, you know, where where was the spirit uh, in between the lines of the Kabbalah? Would it be lost? <laughs> and uh, so, so her banner was uh, also to keep the spirit of these teachings uh, alive and uh, well. But when, when you see uh, chemistry and physiology, you think, why? Mm -hmm. uh, now, 150 years later, I can see that, uh, well, especially in psychiatry, but uh, in life in general as well, uh, we're, we have the metrics now and are capable of uh, measuring scientifically so many facets of our being. And uh, getting familiar with the idea that uh, our thoughts, our thinking patterns <clears throat> have an effect uh, on our chemistry on our chemistry, so that uh, if we are mindful of our thought processes, uh, we can actually have an effect on our biological being, on the way our physiology works. Uh, so the whole idea of neurotransmitters, uh, et cetera. So, I mean, often we think of the physical plane and uh, our body and we think, well, okay, I feel sad, I feel happy, um, I feel depressed, uh, uh, or, you know, I feel, I feel great. But the idea that taking control of our thought patterns and setting the keynote in our thinking can determine uh, the karma of our future neurotransmitters <laughs> and of the well-being of our body. Uh, and that's a that's a profound, I think, realization. Uh, and as as we get to understand ourselves uh, even better, we've learned that. Um, I was thinking about that pamphlet that we have, the powers of the mind. <clears throat> that uh, often we refer to at the lodge. 
uh, uh, the powers of the mind. We have superpowers, right? They call them these days. And uh, the powers of the mind were explained in theosophy as thought, will, imagination, feeling, and memory. And that is, uh, that is a fundamental idea that corresponds not just to us, but to all of life. It may be latent in some of the kingdoms. <clears throat> uh, ours uh, are theoretically uh, activated at our stage uh, and, and beyond to the possibilities uh, and to the hierarchies, uh, et cetera, on their way up. But uh, we, we don't really still, I believe, uh, understand and appreciate and activate uh, to the fullest extent of our being this chemistry, this divine spiritual uh, science uh, was in danger of being lost, and it, it always is. Uh, so I think tonight we'll examine how, what is it we're trying to keep alive? What is it that theosophy has to offer uh, above and beyond what uh, science and medicine have to offer in terms of understanding who we are and, and claiming our powers? Thank you, Elena, very, very much. Um, it sounds like that there uh, is going to be required uh, kind of a new kind of intelligence in our society. Um, and I would like to call on Dr. Ken in this case. Um, he, he and I have talked a little bit about um, instead of it, you know, just the, the whole revolution of being talking about um, emotional intelligence as opposed to uh, just plain pure IQ. Uh, could you uh, speak to what emotional intelligence is and kind of the history of that just a little bit? Oh, thank you. Yes, I'll, I'll give a little quick overview there. So for the longest time here in the U.S. and in the West, IQ or intelligence quotient has been considered to be the main marker or measurable thing for uh, success in life. However, it really just focuses on a particular kind of intelligence. And over the decades, various psychologists especially have looked at different kinds of intelligence, talking about uh, skills in the kinesthetic, you know, moving your body kind of thing, other types of intelligence. And there's a whole variety of that. Ken Wilber talks about various intelligences as well. I would say in the late 80s and early 1990s, uh, the idea of emotional intelligence really got codified by the um, academic psychologists as something that has to do with really four main areas. And those are awareness of yourself and modulation of yourself, self-management, awareness of other people and where they are, you know, emotionally, intellectually, where they're coming from, their history. And then the fourth part is the relationship management, managing the relationship that you have with them. And that is important in many different arenas of life for success, happiness, contentment, <laughs> and basically, as those classical Greeks were looking for, what is the good life? <laughs> so emotional intelligence really seems to be a very key factor. Now, that's not to say that IQ or intelligence or skill or training is not important. So, for example, in the business world, you know, a CEO or someone like that that is very intelligent, high IQ, has a lot of skills and is able to then delegate and oversee uh, a corporation with many departments and many people, that's a good thing. However, if they are lacking the EQ, as it were, the emotional intelligence, or some people call it EI, emotional intelligence, they can really drive that company into the ground, even though they themselves are a smart uh, guy or gal and know a lot of stuff. So, so uh, there's a funny book in real estate, I think Robert Kiyosaki wrote it, is how come A students work for C students? <laughs> kind of a, a little sardonic comment about that. So the IQ and training is important in certain areas, but it's not the most significant factor for success in life or marriage or family or church or any of those things. But emotional intelligence, I think, is a really important arena. So that's a quick little summary of what is um, this EQ thing about. It, it's difficult to measure, just adding on to that. Uh, there are some people that have come up with some scales, the way you might try to measure it, but there's no standardized measurement for that the way there is with EQ, with IQ, with intelligence quotient. 
Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Dr. Ken, for that. Um, and I'm going to draw on Helena Karakazi for a minute here. And um, because it seems like that so much of our thinking, um, and by keep this in mind, then I'm going to call, uh, call on Dr. Jennings to, to fix all this for a minute. But <laughs> there seems to be um, so, so much that goes on in our thinking that's just compulsive that just kind of is almost out of our control. And technically it is under control, but there's just so much of our life and consciousness that just goes on automatic. It's like autopilot. And a lot of these kind of compulsive thoughts that we all think um, and participate in, um, it's just hard to get a handle on them. And uh, Dr. Amon, um, who's what, out in California, he has the Amon Clinic, I believe. Helena Karakazi, and um, he has put together in one of his books, Change Your Brain, Change Your Life, uh, 10, no, nine um, automatic uh, thoughts that he says that we could, should keep track of. Helena, could you kind of run through these a little bit? Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, we may or may not be aware uh, in our thinking <laughs> that uh, when when we're stuck, when we're dealing with other people, uh, when we have strong feelings, uh, that we may be trapped into certain uh, modes of thinking for all different types of re reasons. Uh, we may have um, uh, been influenced by our environment, by our upbringing, by our past lives, uh, uh, but uh, it really behooves us to think about our thinking and where our thought patterns are coming from. So uh, when, when we get stuck and we can't uh, escape a, a train of thought, uh, we might ask ourselves, uh, are, are we engaged in all or nothing thinking, are we overgeneralizing? Uh, everything is good, everything is bad, uh, etc. And Dr. Eamon challenges us to talk to our automatic negative thoughts uh, when, when they uh, occur and ask ourselves, <laughs> is it true? Is it really, really true? Uh, and some of these, when we stop to think about our thought patterns, uh, may be uh, occurring. Uh, our brain does like to generalize uh, and compartmentalize, <clears throat> but sometimes those generalizations overreach and overextend themselves. They're there to help us, uh, but we need to be careful to see if we're getting caught up in always thinking or never thinking, uh, and, and if we start to use those words um, a lot, uh, we can get stuck. Uh, are we focusing only on the negative? Do we only see one side of the um, equation? Are we short-sighted? Uh, are we getting ahead of ourselves? Are we uh, engaging in fortune telling uh, in terms of predicting the worst possible outcome uh, to situations or uh, thinking that we know what another person is thinking, <laughs> um, mind reading, uh, do we really know how somebody else is feeling? We don't, but we make assumptions and those assumptions can get us into trouble. <clears throat> Are we thinking with our feelings? Do we believe negative feelings? Uh, or do we ever challenge them? Uh, and the reality of them. Are we feeling uh, guilty and beating? Or it, what is our self-talk like? Uh, do we should on ourselves or must or to other people? You ought to do this. Or you better do this. Or you have to do this. And and you know force our ourselves onto other people or onto situations. Do we label um, box things in a little bit too tight uh, and not give enough latitude? Uh, there may be things going on in the situation that we don't know about. Um, and do we blame others uh, for the problems uh, that we have because we don't want to take responsibility for co-creating our world 
and our karma and directing uh, our lives? Are, are we swept along with uh, the tide uh, or are we in the undertow <laughs> or, or are we uh, riding the tidal waves of life? Thank you, Helena, very, very much for that. Um, now, I want to call on Dr. Jennings to um, just comment on three big revolutions, basically, that seem to be ongoing even now. And they started in the early 90s, I believe having to do with neurogenesis, neuroplasticity, and epigenetics. And this may seem kind of an abrupt transition from what Helena was talking about, because that's a very existential thing. We're examining ourselves, we're doing self-questioning. But in a way, by doing what Helena and Dr. Amon are, are saying, that's saying that we should be our own uh, revolutionary within our own status quo, and really question things within ourselves. And yet, the science of neurogenesis and neuroplasticity and epigenetics seems to be saying that we're not stuck and that the will, because after, after all, uh, thought, will, and feeling, right, uh, in relation to health. So the will seems to have some kind of uh, an entry point here, wouldn't you say, Dr. Jennings? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm swimming with thoughts uh, only because just with that last word, uh, the will. Um, from a theosophical perspective, will is of spirit. So most people don't exercise will. They will exercise desire in action. And therein lies part of the difficulty with any of these things, or even clarifying the cognitive distortions that Elena just spoke on, or even dealing with the medicine and the physiology and the chemistry and the different types of learning that were mentioned earlier. The one idea that um, we haven't mentioned that is even central to these three is the idea of self and how that gets constructed in the brain. And, and another word that we have to think about carefully in terms of this is the word construct. Because when we're looking at the brain and body, none of it is an inherent whole. They're all separate pieces, billions and billions of pieces somehow miraculously interacting together. And at the heart of that, we can talk about things like neurogenesis, neuroplasticity, and epigen uh, epigenetics. And so the old theory was that everything in the neurological system was static. You're born with it, it's determined by genes. Whether it works or not, you're stuck with it. And the short version is they found out that that was incorrect. They found out that neurogenesis, i.e. the ability to create new neurons is going on on a daily basis. Uh, they've located that primarily to the brain, and there are two areas. Um, I think one is the hippocampal area, uh, which is tied into the temporal lobes or related to the temporal and memories, as well as other functions. And the other is the olfactory. But the question is, even though 5,000, 10,000 of these neurons are generated new every day, they don't all survive. And if they're not carefully nurtured, they really won't benefit the individual. But again, the good news is there's no static. There is no dead end. The genes don't determine everything. And the brain structure you have today doesn't have to be the one you have tomorrow. The idea of neuroplasticity when we consider that, we do have to talk about the chemistry of it. We do have to talk about the physiology of it. We do have to talk about the genetics of it. And we have to talk about this invisible thing called thought and how that impacts brain function. But the simple idea is that neuroplasticity, again, as a new idea, means that the connections that we have in the brain are not predetermined end-all 
end state connections. In other words, the way you're born is not the way you have to die. And so they found out again that on a regular basis, new connections can be formed every day. So the cognitive distortions, the negative thinking, the catastrophic thinking, the selective bias thinking, the looking at one idea versus another, and only that one idea and making that a reality, even though it is a built-in habitual habit, it doesn't have to be your eternal reality. So with neuroplasticity, the simple version is you can create new pathways, new connections, hierarchical as well as laterally in the brain and redesign it. Um, not an easy thing, but can be done. And the idea of epigenetics, uh, really uh, a, a nice analogy of it is that gene expression can be simply turned on or turned off by many factors. And so the idea, if we use the idea of a wire and the insulation around it, the wire is the DNA. The DNA is the genetic template for how things are supposed to develop, how they're supposed to be harmoniously balanced or diseased or whatever. And the wire is the protein membrane. And the membrane interacts with the wire in a weird way such that it can literally turn on and turn off different genes. Now the wire or the membrane itself is very sensitive to the environment. So um, for those of you that have read some of Judge's articles, She's of the Soul, et cetera, he says the environment is everything external to the soul. And so we might even use that from a metaphysical side, but right now we can just focus on the physical side. So the environment means where you live, whether you live in a rural area, whether you live in a city congested area, whether you live in the mountains, that environmental setting will impact how the proteins selectively change on and turn off DNA. What you eat will determine how those proteins are responding and how they turn on and turn off DNA. How you think will determine whether those proteins turn off or turn off certain aspects of DNA. How you're feeling, how your emotional roller coaster is going up and down or remaining calm and stable will turn on and turn off different things. And so even though we don't think about it, we have the ability, and we can't think of this without karma, to selectively objectify by constant review everything in our nature. So that is, as was suggested by Helena in um, the last, expressions about the cognitive distortions, if we're doing review, if we're doing self-review, and we literally, in a brutal way, say, hey, that was a negative thought. Is that a true thought? No. Okay, let me throw it out. That was a biased thought. That was a catastrophic thought. I only looked at the negative. I didn't look at the balanced situation. If we're doing things like that, we're actually putting distance between the way we typically react to situations, and we are now consciously reflecting on how we should act. And when we do that, those proteins, again, in the membranes respond differently and turn on or turn off certain genetic functions. And uh, the last point on this, interestingly enough, they've done some studies on twins. And they manipulated the environments and the experiences of those twins to find out whether or not there would be differences in how those proteins responded and subsequently how certain either diseases or tendencies or biases or even something as simple as hives was expressed. And they found out that these variables 
in terms of environment, in terms of emotion, in terms of interactions, in terms of something as simple as love and support can impact and differ or modify the expression of the underlying condition. So we have it within our purview. Um, if we're really looking at what we are, getting rid of the mislabeled idea of who we are and looking at the system that we're using from a soul's perspective and working with it consciously to bring out the best in it. And then we've got the best of neurogenesis going on, neuroplasticity going on, and epigenetics. Thank you, Dr. Jennings, very much for that. Um, let me see here. Helena, would you um, just read that out? And okay, let's put it this way. While you're giving a plug on your ISIS class, could you comment on this quote from, uh, from, uh, from ISIS Unveiled? Uh, my pleasure. Every imagination of man comes through the heart, for this is the sun of the microcosm. And out of the microcosm proceeds the imagination into the great world, the universal ether. The imagination of man is a seed, which is material. Thank you very much for that. Do you have anything that you'd like to mention about the role of imagination? Because it seems to be a kind of a big current with HPV and uh, kind of even tying in with kind of a Paracelsian uh, approach to things. Well, yeah, out of, this is really probably the biggest superpower, I would say, that we have uh, of our minds is uh, visualizing our, uh, our plan, <clears throat> our thinking, our future. Um, and, uh, you know, they use this word manifestation, you know, these days, which I, I'm not especially fond of, actually, because some people have this magical thinking. <clears throat> and even though, uh, there is magic uh, involved. Uh, I think that uh, that capacity for magic, that pixie dust that we can use when, when we're in tight situations as parents, as teachers, uh, you know, working with family, uh, et cetera, uh, on, on a very practical uh, basis, really depends a lot on how we see ourselves, going back to what Dr. Jennings said. And here is where I think the septenary constitution that theosophy uh, provides for us is, is such a vital starting point <clears throat> to understanding uh, all these different compartments that we can box ourselves into. Um, and I think that is where also uh, the healing, you know, where, where does healing come from? Well, first, uh, we have to understand who we are. And uh, this table, uh, one version of our sem sevenfold uh, uh, nature uh, mm -hmm. that uh, is given out, <clears throat> starts with our gross matter, our bodies at the bottom there, uh, the substance formed and molded over our lingua serrera by the action of prana. So we start with that body. <clears throat> then we had the life principle above it, prana, uh, that produces all the vital uh, phenomena. Uh, the uh, lingua serrera, the inert vehicle or form on which the body is molded, uh, which dissipates very shortly after the disintegration of the body, <clears throat> our astral body. Uh, Kama Rupa, the principle of animal desire, which burns fiercely during life in matter uh, and is inseparable from animal uh, existence. And uh, then we proceed to the Manus principle, uh, mind, booty, our um, 
intuitive spirit soul connection and then atma that ray of uh the highest now uh in in this table in the secret doctrine i believe page uh 290 the uh we see this correlation to carbon oxygen nitrogen and hydrogen and earlier when we were talking about her statement in terms of chemistry and uh, physiology. Uh, uh, this is uh, how we can correlate some of the principles of the chemistry of it. If we are focused on our gross material nature, uh, uh, we can uh, lower ourselves to that carbon state, right? <laughs> uh, if we oxygenate our bodies, you know, now that we've had this uh, terrible pandemic, you know, people, our, our karma has been, in a sense, accelerated into understanding what our physical mechanism, uh, how it operates uh, in this short period of time. We've been very aware of it. Uh, so uh, the more we introduce this oxygenating principle, a life-giving uh, principle, <clears throat> uh, nitrogen, again, as um, uh, uh, entering into all these organic substances, uh, it, it, and, we, and we find this fourfold uh, nature of life throughout our solar system. It's, it's not just here. And then uh, hydrogen, the lightest of all the gases, uh, it burns in oxygen, giving off the most intense heat of any substance in uh, combustion and forming water, the most stable of compounds. Hydrogen enters largely into all organic compounds here. And <clears throat> manas, or mind, the mind principle, uh, there's a bridge between the fourth and the fifth principle. Kama manas, right? Are we in the heat of passion <clears throat> or are we elevating uh, that uh, aspect of our uh, mind uh, to compassion? Uh, and, and how do we do that? The monastic uh, principle, buddhi atma, is our uh, permanent nature. And I was asking myself, how, how do we put the healing into our consideration uh, tonight. And I believe that the healing comes from uh, our thoughts and our actions, the behaviors that we engage in. Uh, where do we connect to these principles of our being? <clears throat> if, if we take a step back, uh, we can question our thoughts and actions and say, uh, are, are, where are they coming from? Are they coming from our chemic nature? Uh, are, are, are they focused and concentrated on the uh, physical plane? <clears throat> or uh, are we capable also of uh, thinking and acting uh, in the highest degree of what we're capable of collectively? Uh, is our mind, is our manas, uh, our thought pattern, taking in the uh, collective nature? Are we accessing the collective wisdom uh, that we've accumulated? Or have, have we set our frequency so that we can actually connect to uh, the Bodhi monastic collective, the ancient wisdom religion that we can tap into and benefit from having that expansive understanding of wisdom? So that's a, a whole bridge to uh, the different aspects of our be being. And if we start here, we could of course extrapolate out because each of these, uh, you can break into uh, seven aspects of gross matter, of kama, of, of prana, uh, et cetera. 
And there are degrees to which we may be uh, focusing our thought and behavior patterns. So we end up being um, unwittingly <laughs> directed uh, by the influence of a series of thoughts that we've generated uh, in this lifetime or previously or uh, picked up from society, from culture, uh, from religion, from institutions, from organizations. Uh, are these really the thoughts that we would like to be associated with? Are we biased in our thinking? Um, our children, you know, how are they affected uh, by these types of thoughts? And uh, we're, we're really keeping our children um, in mind at this time, because certain parts of our being we know now aren't fully developed uh, as uh, at a young stage. It actually takes quite a bit of time for us to reach uh, our potential. And are we having, now that we have all this science and all these metrics, are, are we putting them into practice in, in the way that we live? Are, are we incorporating what we know into the world as it exists in a practical way? Or are we stuck in old biases and old thinking that needs uh, an upgrade on all planes? Uh, because we have more knowledge and, and do we have the courage to take the steps uh, to incorporate what we know now <laughs> into the society that we live in? Well, thank you, Helena, very, very much. Um, I think that at this point, even though I had more questions and more slides and all that, um, it'd be good to allow the remaining time for um for our audience to ask questions, because I'm sure you guys have said so many provocative things um, and evocative things really, um, that um, I'm sure that there are questions. I thought be, while I'm still here, I would show a few slides that we have just so even so that our panelists even know what we have as resources while we're answering the questions perhaps. So let me go back to this thing here. Um, well, that's the quote that we that Helena took off with, which was awesome. And then um, here's uh, interestingly enough for June fourth, um, which is today, in HPV's gems from the east, she talks about uh, the cell, and a judge does too in the uh, synthesis of occult science, and he talks like this. Um, he says life is built up by uh, no, excuse me, this axiom from Gems for the East for today says, life is built up by the sacrifice of the individual to the whole. Each cell in the living body must sacrifice itself to the perfection of the whole when it is otherwise disease and death enforce the lesson. And then there is another slide I just wanna bring your attention to. And Dr. Jennings already referred to um, how the difference between desire and will. And there's this quote for June 25th Will creates intelligently, desire blindly and unconsciously. And there's quite a few quotes in the for the month of June, to be honest, uh, about health uh, of these, because these are general philosophical, uh, alchemical, um, mystical axioms for the whole year. Quite a few of them in the month of June have to do with health. And this is, we already looked at this, but we have it to go back to in our Q&A session. Um, Dr. Jennings requested that I get um, have a, a slide of the human brain. Um, so if one is enough, two is better. Um, two images here. Um, and also Dr. Jennings requested that uh, I have some kind of a slide which uh, depicts the vagus nerve. He thought that he could do quite a bit with that. And so that's just what we have here. Let me see if that's it. Uh, oh yeah, that's it. So let me... Um, Go back to play and um, find one that, maybe I'll just put that up for now. Um, so um, I guess we'll open it up for questions and anyone that Dr. Ken or Dr. Jennings, um, any kind of points that you were hoping to kind of make, uh, hopefully they can kind of come out in the Q and A. Uh, 
So now we open up the panel for uh, questions from the audience. And you can uh, direct your question to any of our panelists or just open, ask it as an open question and they can just jump in as appropriate. Monica. Thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, ask this of, of uh, Dr. Jennings. Uh, given that children are really under attack right now, and regarding this most recent uh, horrific experience uh, that happened in Texas, I'm remembering that you said earlier uh, at, at the beginning how um, DNA, how we're able to, to change it in a way that we probably have been taught that we cannot uh, and have a direct impact on it. Um, that being the case, with so many people in general, and in particular children who are clearly traumatized, does the system that you work in have anything immediately available to them, not to just feel better, but to begin to work at whatever levels of their mind and being to uh, dislodge the trauma? Because is it also true that the trauma changes the DNA as well as a person uh, sitting and consciously uh, creating affirmations for a better life? Okay, uh, um, basic recap uh, in, I guess, in a nutshell, um, can we, working with those children that have been traumatized and, and, and actually continue to be traumatized every day by just environmental factors, um, can we intervene in, in a healthy way? So the very, very short answer is, yes, there's a specific system of intervention entitled trauma-informed care that is utilized with good results for adults as well as for children. And there are certain techniques that have to do with rescripting the entire scenario um, that have to do with grounding individuals because their entire emotional system is disrupted. And so they're overreacting typically. There's a tremendous amount of fear. There's a lot of anxiety going on. There's depression and grief because friends have died. There's anticipatory worries. Is this going to happen again? And so, you know, it, this takes me back to a, a, a study uh, several of us did back in the 90s on PTSD in Compton. And, and any, anyone that's been in LA and, and Compton knows what the gang wars were like then. And so the scenario was we ended up interviewing 75 individuals from age five to age 78. Mm. Short story, 78% of them struggled with trauma. And half of those were children. So they were going to school hyper aroused. They were going to school hyper vigilant. If somebody popped a balloon, they would jump under the chairs because when the gunshots fly, it's self protection. They were not sleeping at night, so it impacted their educational ability to learn. And so they were trying to self-soothe their emotions and their feelings, not to mention the environment that they lived in, not to mention the socioeconomic disadvantages and how they were treated just as people living in that particular area. So we are talking about compounded trauma, not just one school shooting. And then you can add shootings on top of that. 
And so, um, and, and I know uh, 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 Professor Kar uh, Karakazi can speak to the ACE studies that they've done, um, the ACE studies having to do with the multiple ways that individuals can literally be traumatized. So when you're going in, there are certain basic things that you have to do in order to settle these things down, get rid of the hypervigilance, get rid of the flashbacks, the autonomic arousal, the poor sleeping patterns, and the negative thought processes that now become catastrophic and anticipatory, which means that the brain is never relaxed enough to learn. And as you know, we would have spoken about in terms of that hypopituitary adrenal axis, the increased amounts of stress literally shrink the hippocampal areas where in learning and memory and everything else take place. So it's a bad scenario. And so the trauma-informed care techniques can be utilized to help that. But then from a theosophical perspective, considering everything that was presented today, taking into account that people are even without trauma, they've got the negative cognitive distortions, the biased ways of thinking, the emotional roller coasters, the environments that they were brought up in, the way that their parents taught them to believe, which has been reinforced year after year. So when you're going in to treat, you've got to know what you're going in to treat. You've got to know what the groundwork is because none of this is magic. Even though we can talk about epigenetic intervention, it's not going to happen in a person who thinks negatively and has been for 20 years in a week. It's just not going to happen. And so there should be ways that we systematically go through to understand who is the being in front of us, how they conceptualize, what their belief systems are, what beliefs have been reified, because if their beliefs are in stone, then it's going to be very difficult to alter that belief system in order to make it flexible enough and resilient enough to modify the very proteins that we're talking about through thinking differently, feeling differently. Because again, you've got to be in a state of calm and serenity in order to begin to retrain. And if you're in a state of hyperarousal, it's just you're not calming down sufficiently. And then that picture that uh, Jonathan showed with the vagus nerve traveling throughout the whole body. Now you're talking about a means of communication that literally impacts your bowel system, your kidney system, your cardiac system, the way you breathe. So we're talking about the asthmas, we're talking about the bronchial constrictions, and it just turns into a complete medical quasi-catastrophe. And now you're talking about how, and, and, and Dr. Uh, Ken would also know how to talk to this point, when you're talking about the individuals that use the substances to minimize the feelings that they've got to deal with every day that they can't cope with. Not to mention their sense of self. And then we can add on top of that the depressions and the hopelessness and the grief and the suicidality, et cetera. So, I mean, clearly you enter as the alchemical <laughs> magicians would say into the chaos mm. to create some order out of chaos before you can begin to treat it, but it can be done. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jennings. Uh, Dr. Ken, uh, would you uh, just, if do you have anything to weigh in on this uh, before we go to the next question? Uh, yes, I would just say that um, there is a part of our fight or flight, you know, emergency uh, traumatized system that is very primitive. And some people are saying it's part of the early development of brains in uh, various species and us as mammals as well. And that part of the alert to a danger, like, you know, the PTSD people or a gunshot, that sort of thing, part of alert to a danger was baked into our DNA and our physiology as a survival mechanism. And then, of course, with these special circumstances, either, um, as one person calls it, uh, trauma porn on the news, talking about all the horrible things that are happening, or a real, you know, gunshot <laughs> in Compton or a, a balloon popping. Some of that 
goes through the thalamus directly to the frontal cortex it, and can at, attack our responses. So as others, as Dr. Gene Jensen was saying, respond versus react, we will react urgently, but maybe not respond. And so that one quote from Lovasky, will creates intelligently desire blinds unconsciously. So those reactions um, are can be very dangerous in many scenarios and many circumstances. And so our task as theosophists is to really strengthen that part of our our physiology and our mind and our brain. And we can help other people do that, those traumatized folks, to strengthen that part of their mind that can say, oh, wait a minute, that danger isn't happening right now. I'm not in imminent threat from a saber-toothed tiger. And it is it is effective. But realize that our physiological substrate is geared towards uh, noticing danger and, re and reacting to danger. And so we can add that higher level as theosophists, as practical theosophists, not only to ourselves, but to help other people as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Ken. Uh, could we take a panel? Could we take a question from uh, Anthony? You might have to. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. This is, yes, this is for the, uh, for, for, for our three panelists. I was wondering, considering your um, very, very um, structured disciplines as mental health professionals, what part, if any, does intuition play in your own dealings with case by case um, um, involvement? I was wondering about that. Okay, panelists, don't everybody jump in at once. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Karakazi, do you wanna address that? I was just looking at ISIS. <laughs> And uh, we're in the early stages of studying ISIS on Monday nights. On Monday nights? And, and what time, Helena? <laughs> well, I, I try to be there at 7.15, but the meeting okay. opened said 7. Okay. And um, this paragraph uh, really, um, I think, speaks to this intuition uh, question, because where does intuition come into play when we're working with a really traumatized individual uh, and who may be reacting, you know, who may be, um, as Ken likes to say, uh, emotionally dysregulated, right? Because it's, is it really mental health or is it emotional health or what kind of health? Is it um, existential <laughs> Uh uh, what, what is coming up and what gets uh, triggered. So there's a part of us, right, that can connect. First thing we have to do is to connect to the situation and also to the person uh, on some level. And, um, you know, at times uh, here, she says, um, our present day philosophers lift the veil of ISIS for Isis is but the symbol of nature, but they see only her physical forms. The, the soul within escapes their view, and the Divine Mother has no answer for them. There are anatomists who, uncovering to sight no indwelling spirit under the layers of muscles, the network of nerves or matter, which they lift with the point of the scalpel, and assert that man has no soul. Such are as purblind in sophistry as the student who, confining his research to the, to the cold letter of the Kabbalah, dares say it has no vivifying spirit. To see the true man who once inhabited the subject which lies before him on the dissecting table, the surgeon must use other eyes than those of his body. So the glorious truth covered up in the hieratic writings of the ancient papyri can be revealed only to him who possesses the faculty of intuition, which if we call reason the eye of the mind may be defined as the eye of the soul. I love that definition. If reason is the eye of the mind, 
then intuition may be defined as the eye of the soul or or, or bigger eye. Uh, it, and if we, uh, you know, if we try to connect to someone and we bring in all our judgments and assumptions, et cetera, we're really limiting the scope and range of how we connect to people. Uh, but if we bring in, you know, these other uh, higher intuitive aspects, if we bring in the collective, right, as we might imagine a Mahatma might do with a student and say, okay, let me go through all the aspects of being and acknowledge the soul in the other that is struggling to come through. And we're going to help to lift that veil if we can and get to the source of that uh, dysregulation. You know, um, uh, and, and I think here we're uh, developing those uh, powers of observation, not only, you know, with our eyes looking out into the world, but the inner, the inner eyesight for ourselves and being a bridge to someone who may have that vision occluded, you know, but is struggling to liberate their souls, to set it free from the trappings that they're caught up in. Because really, that's what we're all doing. And if we can affirm that soul nature in the being, which Dr. Jenning does so well, maybe he'll give us some hints on how to do that. <laughs> Ken had his hand up a minute ago. <laughs> I was going to say that um, one thing that I had delved into for a little while was Michael Harner's Foundation for Shamanic Studies. And there was another psychiatrist who was actually from Moscow, working here in California. And we kind of connected on Theosophy and HPB. She was surprised that anyone in the West knew anything about HPB. But we would share with each other our secrets uh, that, yes, we would rely on intuition to help us in some maybe inspirations that seem to come from outside the rational mind or the scientific mind or the CBC and the x-ray in working with our patients. But it was not in the pharmacy therapeutics committee prescribed procedures that we could do in the state hospital. So we kind of kept it a secret, <laughs> but that would sneak in from time to time. Thanks. And and, and, and I would just say that there are two things. Uh, one is very practical and, and that's uh, again, something that uh, Professor Karakazi is very well aware of the mirror neurons. And mirror neurons are just neurological cells in the brain that literally not only reflect every expression and emotion that a person has that you are looking at, but then activates the same areas in your brain. So what that translates to when it's really developed is pure empathy. And so when you're with anyone for any reason, the first thing is to get self out of the way. When self is out of the way, and from a physiological, neurological perspective, the, the mirror neurons are working well, then you're in the same space as they are. You establish that rapport. And that was mentioned by Professor Karakazi. Uh, the second way has to do with truly that intuitional faculty that enters into the nature of a being. And we can look at that and talk about that from an astral perspective or even from a monastic resonant perspective. And those are two dimensions that obviously are not spoken of in science and in medicine. They're, they're, they're barely acknowledged. And yet we know that for every emotional vibration, there is a medium in which that is registered. And when fields overlap and you've removed yourself from the equation, you can literally intuit the field of another. And then the only question is, what is the nature of the interpretation? And so the teachers of uh, HPB talk about some of the difficulties with translating astral waves into information. And then the other side from the physiological and personal 
if you're not getting yourself out of the way, again, as was mentioned earlier, your belief systems interfere, your interpretations interfere, your reactions interfere and can actually shut down the rapport that's going on between you and the individuals that you're with. Uh, the other thing that you have to be careful about is that you may pick up information that they're not ready to hear. So even if you are asking them, am I hearing you correctly? Am I understanding you correctly? Am I interpreting what you're telling me correctly? And you're watching them. Some of them may tell you no, only because it's not time. And if it's not time, that's not something that you force. Right. So, you know, there, there are a lot of different ways to be in tune with or intuitionally relate to human beings, period. Thank you very much. Um, just a little note. Um, our time is technically up. However, if the panel is willing to stay on and if somebody's anniversary is willing to be a little bit postponed. <laughs> um, um, we do, uh, we'll just, you know, we'll just keep going for a little while if that's, um, any, so in other words, anyone who would like to stay and if the panelists will agree to this, uh, we'll take some more questions. Um, now I saw maybe Laura had to leave um, and she's welcome to ask. No, I'm here, I'm here. You wanna go ahead and well, looking at this trauma, and HPV said that this last quarter of the century would be a problem for humanity, but will we get better at handling this trauma? And has, has there been studies done on those who are able to handle trauma better? And what would the, be the difference in their physiology, in the brain, that they can handle this trauma? and um, overcome it more quickly than others. And, um, and then of course the role of meditation and finding that still place um, that is not a denial of their feelings and what they're going through, but to still the still place with, which helps them to not take their identity from the experience that they have had. Can, can I just jump in then, you know, as, as, as Ken and Helena are thinking, um, a couple of years ago, not a couple of years ago, as, as Ken would say back in the, uh, <laughs> the 80s and the 90s, I think perhaps even earlier, they, they did do studies because not everyone that experiences trauma develops PTSD. Not, any, not everyone that experiences severely negative re reactions develops acute stress or any of the other aberrations. Why? Because their system of interpretation, which we typically don't talk about, we talk about belief, but even before belief comes interpretation. So if we think about how the Abhidharma talks about that whole line of registering information, or even if you think about it from the point of view of the Nindanas, there is contact, there is sensation, there is transmission, there is immediate registration that the senses pick up and become aware of. Then from all of the senses, there's got to be integration. Once that integration occurs, there's got to be brain representation. And the neural neurologists that, that, that are working with the brain realize that everything is being constructed moment by moment. So on the one hand, if something goes wrong with the transmission, we're getting wrong information. On the other hand, if everything goes right, and the representation is there in the brain as, as Ken would say, the saber-toothed tiger. Now that image has to be compared to the memory banks. If we mistake that saber-toothed tiger for a cat, then we're in trouble. But if we've had prior experiences, 
and we have a sense of what that saber-toothed tiger can do, then our interpretation is got to get out of here. That interpretation then generates action. And so even before we reflect, we've got several steps at which point anything can go wrong. So if we have, let's just say, been brought up in an environment for ease of purposes of expression that has been loving, that has been reinforcing, that has been one that has said, no matter what the obstacle you can overcome, you know, you can get past this. Even if you get hurt, you're going to heal. You know, it's about love. There is never any negative experiences that happen to you. There's only negative interpretations. So if all of that has been instilled and reified in an individual, they will deal with everyday occurrences in a very positive way and will derive happiness from overcoming the obstacle. And so therein will not be trauma per se. But now if you've got an individual that's brought up the opposite way, even if someone curses them out, that's trauma. So looking at it just from the physiological, biological belief system way, and how, again, with that vagus nerve, how with that hypopituitary axis, our thoughts trigger tremendous reactions in our body that turn things on, that turn things off, that generate fight or flight. If all of that is going on based on a simple interpretation, we can see how individuals with different mindsets will encounter, interpret, and respond to information, some positively, some negatively. And so that's kind of the short version of that answer without even getting into the meditational aspect of transforming experiences. And, and don't forget, and we've not really spoken about it, at the core of all of this, is the idea of self. If you really believe that you are a self that can be hurt, then you're gonna be hypervigilant on every point. You're gonna be liking things and disliking things. And you're going to create a network of cognitive thoughts in your mind that are full of biases, prejudices, need to hide, need to be safe, need to get angry. And you will then identify with your emotions as opposed to telling yourself, wow, right now I am experiencing a sense of fear. And if I'm experiencing a sense of fear, the question is, how do I want to understand it? And what do I want to do about it? And yes, that's different than fight or flight with the saber tooth tiger, but you had that experience before, so you know you're going to run. But it still doesn't have to be traumatic. And so there are a lot of variables in there that depend on the individuals, the environment, the way they've been brought up, the way they've been taught to think and interpret experience. Because in, in my world, truly, there is no reality. There is the interpretation of events that we then reify and continue to believe are real, whether they are true or not. And that is the core aspect of Maya. And we don't even have to look at it from a metaphysical perspective. This is how people think every day. Could I jump in there? Um, in the uh, great master's letter, um, he seems to be indicating that, or he, I said, he, she, it, they. Um, anyway, the the teacher in the great master's letter seems to be indicating uh, that the emphasis over perhaps over emphasis on survival is kind of a disease of our age. Um, could you either reframe that question in you've, you've almost got that letter memorized, but I was wondering if you could address that. The um, um, the instinct for survival, survival of the fittest. And it's and, saying yeah. in the letter that, that, that it's, we're just too much about that in our society, perhaps. Right. I mean, you know, and again, it's, it's I driven. You know, mm -hmm. it's I driven. I've got to survive. The one who dies with the most is, is better off. 
Mm -hmm. um, so that I, which they call the sense of I, not a real I in and of itself, distinct, separate from anything else, is the illusionary factor that fears for itself. And so once we talk about I, we're talking about fear because something then can happen to that I in a way that we don't want. And so we're selectively then picking out what's going to be beneficial for the I, what's going to be dangerous for that I, who likes the I, who doesn't like the I, who's gonna help the I, who's not going to help the I. And then that results in a whole avalanche of cognitive distortions, biases, assumptions, worries, fears that really don't exist. When any of us literally go through our thoughts in a day review, not what we've done, but what we've thought, and we look at our thoughts and then simply ask ourselves, how many thoughts did we think? How much of those thoughts did we believe? And then how many of them were actually true? We waste tremendous mental energy based on this idea of I in conjunction with the world around us that we feel we have to be safe from. And so that I sits centrally, or that idea of I sits centrally at this nature of survival and the survival of the fittest, and I've got to do whatever I've got to do in order to stay alive, even if I've got to destroy 10,000 people. And so that in and of itself, and the instinct of needing to survive is a problem, as opposed to recognizing the true nature or the truer nature of what the individual uh, soul might be, as was suggested by Professor Karakazi in, in her presentation on, you know, this whole review. Dr. Ken, uh, I see in the chat that you've got to go. Uh, do you have anything where you'd like to um, weigh in on what's been talked about and some of these questions? I, I really wanted to underscore what uh, Dr. Gene Jennings was mentioning about identity after the end of that really eloquent explanation of how different people respond to trauma, there's this sense of identity. So who is the I that is being affected by this trauma? And that I think is a, a huge part of our, our spiritual path here in theosophy is to recognize that. Some like the Bhagavad Gita where in chapter one, Arjun is despondent and, and he's upset about having to do these things because he has all these ideas about who he is. And then through that whole developmental process, his sense of identity is expanded and growing and growing. And so for us as theosophists, I think that's a really important thing. And then we can impart that to, to others as well, to give them that uh, equanimity and that serenity mm -hmm. that the Buddhists talk about, that they can realize that they're more than just their individual self that we think of. And our materialistic world has really promoted that idea, you know, that especially um, maybe modern reductionistic, materialistic, atheist thinking that, you know, we're just a human body and, and that erroneous thought that we've overturned in some of the quotes today that thoughts originate from our mind as opposed to thoughts originate from higher levels of our septenary nature and that then manifest into the physical mind. Thank you so much, Dr. Ken. And um, in, in I just want to thank the panel. Um, there is, and I do want to call on Professor Karkazi to do some wrap up comments. But before we do that, and while Dr. Ken is still here, I just want to read out uh, something that Monica Page wrote because she's so, such a beautiful writer. Dr. Campos, Professor Karakazi, Doc, and Dr. Jennings, what a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Incredible minds, grateful. I feel exactly the same. So, um, and uh, Professor Karakazi, would you care to just uh, put a cap on this? And if you, do you have any final thoughts or wishes or anything that you'd like to express? Uh, well, I, uh, you know, in terms of uh, fear, 
um, I, I think of a judge's article uh, also on you know these these different feelings that we have uh, that create um, the type of portal, you know, and and we think about the triangular nature, you know, or our real self, you know, um, that uh, ascends and lifts us, uh, lifts up our souls and our spirits. Uh, fear uh, does the opposite. You know, it it shrinks the it shrinks the uh, opening uh, and uh, uh, limits it. So uh, you know, our, our expansive uh, nature uh, can can handle these things and and opening. Uh, that perspective uh, so that we can really uh, make the changes that um, I think we need to make uh, to build a better world, you know, to lead, to create better skandhas collectively, you know, those bundles of, uh, of energy, of thinking, you know, that they come back at us, you know, I mean, uh, we see that with the viruses uh, as well. Uh, we're brought into very accelerated karma right now of our being and prioritizing what it is we think we are, you know, how we can get, uh, you know, through this uh, and the repercussions and sow the seeds because there is another side uh, uh, to all of this that uh, we don't need to run away from but towards you know or we've we we also have accelerated our learning curve at this point I mean, people know more medical jargon than ever <laughs> that they might not have cared to but uh, there's a part of us that's embracing our entire self our health our healing you know our families um, our spiritual path and reprioritizing uh, and shaking it up so that we can rise to the challenges of this moment, which I do believe we can. We can. Wow. Thank you all very much, panelists, um, for your just out of the park answers. I just couldn't be happier. Thank you so much for participating and what a informative and enlightening evening. And uh, I just, I don't know, you might have noticed the tonality, all you audience folks like me, of the compassionate tonality of this meeting and of these wonderful healers that we need so much and who have come in from the front lines to help us think about this in the light of theosophy. So thank you all very much for attending and for your questions. And uh, next week, uh, we'll be uh, taking up a theme that is similar. It's called Aquarian Therapy something to think about. I'm sure there'll be some magic to that, um, that line of thinking. So thank you all very much, panel and audience.